right, hello everybody, and welcome back to another episode of the Beef Up Front podcast here on PicSwap Media. If you're listening to this on our audio feed or if you're watching on YouTube, if you haven't already, please subscribe. Uh, we just recently hit over 220 subscribers, so definitely growing the channel. Exciting stuff here. Ahead from the PicSwap Media team, um, we're in full NBA draft mode right, right now, cranking out a lot of content before next week's draft on Thursday, June 23rd. Um, I have given you a mock draft so far of the lottery. My top eight prospects was Sean. Yesterday, I went over a lot of my under-the-radar guys. Today, I'm going to be touching on some of the prospects I'm viewing as potential bust players in this draft, guys who I don't think might necessarily succeed or live up to the billing that they might be getting drafted at. Yesterday, a lot of the guys I had were potential undraftees or second-round players. A lot of these guys are uh, – Looking at the first round for maybe the first few of them, and then as we get down, there's some second-round guys that I think might not even deserve to be drafted um, and potentially might just be a, a one or two years in the league type of guy and then be in the G League primarily from there. Um, there's a lot of the undrafted guys that we're looking at right now potentially who I think are going to be better than some of these guys who I think just there's not really a spot in the league for them. A lot of them, it, it kind of hurt me to make this list, are really good college players who I – watch a lot of them were some really fun guys to watch, but I just don't really see a role for them in the NBA right now. It's a changing game. You have to be able to consistently shoot the ball, defend on the perimeter if you want to stay in the league. And a lot of these guys just can't do that. At least right now, maybe they can develop into that, but they're like established college players. And I think if they were going to be able to develop into that, they would have done that already. So with that being said, we'll start at the top. This is going to be Maybe a bit of a hot take. Um, I know this is Sean's favorite guy in the draft, and this is one of my top five guys in the draft, but this is Chet Holmgren for me. I think he is a potential bus candidate, the seven-foot forward out of Gonzaga. To start off with, no question about his talent whatsoever. A super talented player can do a little bit of everything, and I think he's going to be really good on the defensive end of the floor in terms of rim protecting, just uh, weak side blocks. And then he can also push the ball. He can shoot the three ball as well. He can do a lot of stuff on the court. But at seven foot, 195 pounds, you've seen pictures, you've seen videos of him, a really, really frail frame. And I'm just worried about that, whether it's in his first year or two in the league, durability concerns, or even just long, long-term concerns. If he's unable to put on that weight, I think he's really going to struggle. He's not going to be able to guard guys in the post like Joel Embiid, Nicole Jokic, even like a Bam Adebayo if he's forced to – play like the four guard Giannis. I think those guys are just going to be able to bully him consistently um, and just punish him on the interior. But then you also have the con- the concerns and the questions about his overall like long-term health. He has, like I said, a frail frame. He could have a lot of broken bones, uh, who knows, soft tissue injuries. He's just not a very like, athletic-looking person out on the floor and just doesn't really have that NBA body. So I'm really concerned about that. I think worst case scenario, a bust for him would just be like a rotational player who comes off the comes off the bench for a team and is able to shoot threes and consistently protect the rim. Like like I was talking about earlier, weak side blocks and whatnot. But if you're picking him and like he's going to be one of the top three picks most likely, and he's probably not getting past two in, in my guess. You need like an all star perennial, like all pro type of guy with that pick to, to really live up to the ceiling. So he might be viewed as a bust, even if he's like a 10, 11 points per game, points per game type of guy, shoots around 35, 40%, uh, decent rebounder and block shots. He just needs to be better than that. And I'm worried about that just because I don't think he's going to be able to play in all the necessary games. So Chet Holmgren on my bus watch. Uh, number two guy. I think he's the most polarizing player in this draft. This is a list of eight guys I put together. Yesterday with my underrated, I gave 10. Today we're just going through eight. Um, this is Shaden Sharp, six, six guard out of Kentucky. Didn't play a game at Kentucky. He was like a December or January enrollee. Um, never got on the floor there due to personal decisions. Um, just some weird stuff with his age and when he graduated high school. I just think he is too much of an unknown right now. Some people are calling him the best prospect in the draft. And I just don't think we can put him in that conversation. Um, If he really is as good as the media says, and he has that number one pick ability, I wish we got to see it more than just some high school games and some AAU games. To me, it kind of looks like he ran away from potentially showcasing the type of player he is and what he could bring to the table on a consistent basis. And he just played it safe, which I think might ultimately wind up hurting him and costing him a few million out of this draft, I think he could fall maybe like five, six, seven, eight range. 
Uh, probably doesn't get past eight. But if he's as talented and he's supposed to be like the best prospect in this draft, which I've seen people say, I, I think it's just too much of a, a concern and too much of a, a major question mark right now. So I think he's going to have the steepest learning curve out of any of these top level prospects. Because by the time he begins his NBA career, he will not play competitive basketball in like a year and a half. So that's a lot of time away from the game. He has the requisite, requisite size, athleticism, and apparently a shot making ability. But we haven't seen that against, you know, elite level competition besides the EYBL. So he has all the tools to be a productive player, but I think he has too many question marks for me. Just a player that I'm staying away from. If somebody else gets gets him and he's really successful, fine, so be it. I'll live with it. But I think it's just too much of a question mark. Third guy on our list, we're going with Jeremy Sohan, forward, six foot nine out of Baylor, freshman this past year. This is another guy where I don't really think we heard that much from him. During the college season, he obviously played on a really talented Baylor team with a lot of good players, so he might have got overshadowed in that regard, but Fast forward to now, he's in the lottery discussion, and he's one of those kind of players who I think kind of came out of nowhere for me. Um, that is a, a – it's a pretty shocking thing for me to see him as high as he is. He's an athletic player with really nice size at six foot nine, and he has the ability to guard on the perimeter as a big. So, obviously, that's the most intriguing thing about him. But I think he's also going to be a pretty solid player in terms of the pick and roll game and running the floor, being an athlete and catching lobs. But he is a liability on the offensive end outside of that. Only shot 29% from three this year, not very many attempts, only 59% from the line. So it doesn't seem like he's a very good overall shooter. I don't know if he'll get much better than that 29%. Like I said, not a very high volume of attempts, but still. Um, his ability to defend on the perimeter, though, and his athleticism is really is what appealing to teams. And it's going to get him picked high, but I think he should be a guy in like the 20s rather than the lottery. I've seen him in the pot potential top 10 of some mock drafts as well, so. A guy that I'm not necessarily staying away from, like I would Shade and Sharp, um, as weird as that might sound, but he's a guy that I'm going to kind of like pass down the board. I'm not really reaching for him and too excited about his future. We're going to be talking about some other big men who are probably better college players than Sohan, but don't translate to the league as well. But I just don't think his offensive ability is going to make him that much of an asset in the NBA. He'll be able to play you some strong defense, but still – we're looking for, if we're picking in the lottery, guys who can consistently start um, and be really productive players on both ends. And I think he's just too limited on the offensive end, at least right now, to take that high. So he's on my bus watch as well. Now we're getting down into the guys who are probably going to be second-round picks, who I think might not even be worthy of the pick and maybe should even go undrafted. This one really hurts for me to say. He was one of my favorite players, having watched a lot of late-night college basketball, the 11, 11 o'clock Eastern time tips. He was a guy I turned on a lot on CBS Sports Network, and that's David Roddy, the six foot five Ford out of Colorado State, similar to a few guys that we'll be talking about later, but a really, really good college player with a lot of skills that I really like to watch, like I said. But I just don't see him translating to the NBA well. 6'5, 250 pounds. He's just got like a weird, like chubby frame where he doesn't really have a clear cut position, and I don't know what his role really would be in the NBA. Last year, he shot really well from deep, and that maybe could let him stick around. He shot from 43% uh, from three-point range, but the year before that, only 27%, and the year before that, only 19%. So maybe this past year was an outlier, or maybe he really cleaned up his stroke and his mechanics, and he figured out a way to consistently shoot the three-ball better. Um, I think he's going to be picked on on the defensive end. He's just going to be abused on that end of the floor. So he'll have to be like a 44%, 45% three-point shooter to really be able to stick on the floor. Um, if he's going to be that big of a liability on the defensive end. So I think his demise will be, like I've touched on, the defensive end of the floor. And that's really going to hurt him. 6'5", 250 pounds. He needs to get in like better athletic shape. Like I said, his frame isn't that like appealing right now in terms of being able to muscle up other strong athletic wings. I think they'll be able to take advantage of him on the, that end of the floor uh, night in, night out. So I think that's why David Roddy, I don't think, is going to be a successful NBA player. Another guy. This is a freshman, um, Patrick Baldwin Jr., six foot nine forward out of Milwaukee, a former top recruit, went to Milwaukee, University of Milwaukee, to play in the Horizon League for his dad. That backfired. He had a terrible season. His dad got fired. Milwaukee was one of the worst teams in that league, and they were supposed to be one of the best this year with Baldwin coming in. But a lot of that could be attributed to his health. He had some up and down with his health this year. Maybe a team is able to get a steal with him in that regard if he can be healthy. But he only shot 34% from the field this year and 26% from three. And he's a guy 
who was labeled as a shooter coming in and he's still being labeled as a shooter. And those numbers don't exactly bank on that. So you look at a guy like I talked about with the underrated prospects like Bryce McGowan's where he wasn't that efficient in terms of his shooting splits, but you saw a lot more and you saw it against better competition in the Big Ten, some of the games that he could have and some of his potential. Baldwin was in a bad spot like McGowan's as well, where I think they saw a lot of the defensive attention that could be a big part of it. But like I said, for a guy who's labeled as a shooter to only shoot 34 from the field is super concerning and 26% from three is terrible as well. So maybe if you're picking in the fifties, like I talked about yesterday, there's only 58 picks this year. So if you're between like 50 and 58, he's still on the board and you want to take a shot on a guy like him, who's still young, has a good frame, a pretty good athlete and was a really successful high school player. I'd be all right with that instead of taking like a four-year college player who already has that tapped out seal. And at that point, it's kind of, I think it's worth it to take the swing, swing for the fence and maybe uh, find a steal. So I just really don't see the allure with this young man right now, especially when, when he's supposed to be um, a really high level shooter. And that's what he struggled with most at the college level at a lower program uh, level as well. So not really sure on the Patrick Baldwin hype. He's a guy that I'm not interested in. And I think is going to struggle in the NBA as well. Um, now these next few guys are some of the better college players that we saw from this past year and even over the past few years. We'll start it off with a Big Ten forward slash center in Travion Williams, uh, six foot ten out of Purdue. Another really productive college player, very good big man in the Big Ten, really good passer for his size. That's probably what he did best. But he doesn't fit the mold of the modern NBA big. He played limited minutes in college. Um, I think that was. Definitely in part of the presence of Zach Eady, seven foot four center. You can't keep a guy like that off the court much. But also his conditioning. Before Eady got around, he was only playing around like 20, 24 minutes a game. So I'm not sure if his conditioning will really translate over to the 82 game season in the NBA. Can't guard on the perimeter, not good in that regard, and isn't athletic enough to evolve in that regard. I think where if you look at some some of the players where I talked about yesterday, um, for example, like a Caleb Houston, he's got all the tools and all the athleticism to develop into a really good defender if he wants to. Travion Williams, in, in that in his regard, not very agile, not really good in his in terms of his lateral movement. So I think he's going to struggle there. And he doesn't really shoot it that well either. Doesn't shoot that many threes. I would rather take a swing on a more athletic player, a uh, player with better defensive ability and the chance to develop more on the offensive end, like a Jalen Williams, a guy out of uh, Arkansas. I'd rather take my chance on him, a younger guy, a freshman this past year, then a guy like Travion Williams. Two more guys on our list. One of the better college players over the past five years, I think we could say, and that's Kofi Coburn, seven-foot center out of Illinois, a very dominant college player, one of the best centers of the past decade probably, not just players, but decade in terms of centers. He's probably on like the top five, top ten list. But just another player, I don't see a place for him in today's NBA, especially in the playoffs where we've seen – Rim protecting centers that aren't mobile and don't really switch onto ball screens and aren't able to go out and guard on the perimeter and don't stretch the floor on offense, just get ran off the floor. Even look at Rudy Gobert. He was terrible in that series against the Mavericks. They just continued to expose him and put him in ball screens. Kofi was great in college just because he was purely bigger and stronger than everyone that he played against night in and night out, and he was just an imposing force. Now he's going to be playing against seven-footers every single night, and he doesn't bring to that much to a team outside the paint. So 50 years ago, he's probably a top-10 pick, maybe even a top-5 pick, but I just don't see him translating that well over to the NBA today. A player who got drafted a few years ago, kind of similar to him, but Kofi was better in college, but in terms of frame and just overall skill set, Udoka Azubuki hasn't really translated that well over into the NBA either. I thought maybe even two or three years ago, there's still a place for a guy like this in terms of maybe he starts like 10, 15 games a season. If you look, if you look at like a team like the Sixers with Joe Embiid, you're giving him some rest, or if he's hurt 10, 15 games a season, able to play, eat up some minutes during the regular season. Sure, that could be all right. But in terms of the playoffs, you need a guy, a big man who's able to defend ball screens and Coburn. That's really his weakest part of his overall game, I think, in terms of on the defensive end. And like I said, not very much of a threat on offense outside of the paint. It's just going to he's just going to struggle to stick on the floor. Last guy on our list, we're going with one of the more unique uh, players that we've seen in college basketball over the past few years and a guy I kind of only found out more so about the second half of this college basketball season. That's Kenneth Lofton, six foot seven forward out of Louisiana Tech. To start it off, six seven, two hundred seventy five pounds. So not exactly the best frame there. And he 
he like was not one of those guys who waited till the last second of the deadline to kind of take his name out or leave it in the draft. He had like, I think some pretty good Intel where it's like, you're going to get drafted because he left his name in with like two or three weeks left to go. So that was really confusing to me. I thought if he went back to college, came back in better shape, then he could have played himself into maybe even a late first round pick. Um, if not a second round guy. And it's not like this is like a six seven two seventy five muscled up. Like he looks like a YMCA player, kind of in the David Roddy build, where like just like a chubby guy, but just a good basketball player. And it's a shame because he was really productive in college and a really fun player to watch at Louisiana Tech. Watched a lot of them in the CUSA tournament, but I just can't see it translating with him to the next level. He's going to get absolutely destroyed on the defensive end of the floor by guards and wings, and he doesn't really offer any type of range. You would think. At that size, maybe he could step out and shoot some threes as well. That's why he would be so good. Um, but he only shot 11 threes, I believe I saw in college. Not a great free throw shooter either, so I'm not sure if he's going to be able to translate with just some more reps from three-point range, if he's going to be able to get better at that. He just might not be a very good shooter. His conditioning is going to limit his playing time as well. If he's going to want to play in the NBA, he's got to get down to around 260 to like 50 range. Um at best, maybe he gives you like 10 to 12 minutes on offense in the front court at a high level. One of the things he does really well is pass the ball for a guy his size. And he can also handle the rock, which is weird to watch. He's just a really weird player to watch. Go watch him. It was really fascinating. But watch him and then think about like what we're seeing in the NBA Finals. He just doesn't look like kind of any of those guys out there. So maybe like a 10 to 12 minute off the bench type of guy, um, play some high level offense, but he'll get destroyed on the defensive end and his plus minuses won't be looking that good. So it doesn't have a very high ceiling in my eyes. But that'll do it for this episode of the Beef Up Front podcast here on PickSwap Media. Talking about some guys who I think are bust potential in terms of their NBA ceilings in this upcoming draft. We'll be back with a few more episodes before the draft. But like I said at the beginning, if you haven't already, please subscribe to the channel, share it. We're posting all over social medias as well. So uh, thank you, everyone, for the support. And we look forward to continuing to grow the channel. And we will.